Hi, my name is Joe Jackson. I was barely into my teens when I picked up a 1956 magazine that was more than 10 years old and called Elvis, His Loves and Marriage. It had great pictures of the king, which is really all that mattered to me. However, I found fascinating the fact that on the cover was a picture of Elvis holding a woman and her face had been blanked out. But over her head it said, could this lucky girl be you? I wondered even then who it was and how she might have felt about having her face erased on the cover of a magazine. How was I to know that the woman in question was actually featured in the magazine, and someone whose picture I cut out to place in my Elvis scrapbook, June Wanico. More to the point of childhood dreams in the life of an Elvis fan, namely me, coming through later in life, how could I have known that 30 years later I would get to meet and interview June Wanico? At the time, she'd released what I thought to be a wonderfully evocative book about her time of relative innocence with Elvis Presley in 1956. It was called Elvis in the Twilight of Memory. So I was more than happy to talk with the woman. However, here I should say, for those who haven't read the book and may find some of the references confusing, the magazine to which we refer at the start is, of course, Elvis, His Loves and Marriage. And when we joke about June being what she calls the one that got away, this is a reference to the fact that at one point she was in bed with Elvis and they were just about to consummate their lovemaking when Elvis's mother, Gladys, noticed they'd gotten very quiet and knocked on the bedroom door. And later during the interview, June says that Gladys suggested that if Elvis and June were going to make love, perhaps she should get some pills. This is a wonderfully candid conversation with one of the first great loves of Elvis Presley's life. Well, Elvis did pop. Huh? Elvis did pop music. Elvis the king of pop. As, no, Michael Jackson, I think. No, I don't care what Michael Jackson says, you know? <laughs> and I don't care who his ex-wife is. <laughs> <laughs> Fact, Someone I, said I, to me the other day, just think if you'd have played your cards right, you could have been Michael Jackson's mother-in-law. Oh, wow. Does that keep I you said, awake at night? isn't that nice? <laughs> now, when Jackson came here last Saturday, three weeks ago, I reviewed Elvis's platinum box. I, I worked for the Irish Times, too, mm-hmm. the day before, and I insisted on the headline being King of Pop. <laughs> so it was like, and I had in brackets, uh, all of the contenders or pretenders, you know. <laughs> this is the man. Okay, so now what I've done is, this, this is really strange, because... <clears throat> I've already written an article for Hot Press, and you gave me the idea for this. Idea? Oh, yeah. Honestly, you did. Honestly, I read your book five, four weeks ago. Oh, well, it, you know, I, may, I think doing an article for my book is the best article that you could well, possibly no, do. But, no, I can you, still do an interview yeah. with you, but mm-hmm. I took it to kind of say that you're, you're one of the first persons to, one of the first ex-girlfriends to really break the silence. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, I mean, I saw your story, and uh, I mean, I'm one of those people who actually bought, got that magazine as a kid, with your face cut out. Oh, really? You're that old? I had no, no idea. No, not that old. I got in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were very sensitive. Yeah, I was that old. I bought it on the day it came out. I can give you a funnier story. Um, about 10 years ago, I was in, we used to have this open air market just down there, mm-hmm. like a flea market. Mm-hmm. And I had gotten the magazine, like I'm Elvis fan since I was a child. And uh, I had got that magazine from my cousin's uh, girlfriend. And I thought it was fantastic when I got it in the 60s. In the 80s, I was walking in that flea market and I saw somebody walk by with three copies of it. I ran after the guy and I said, where did you get that? And it was in mint condition. And he said, oh, there's a woman inside has hundreds of them. I went back in and uh, this is the irony of Ireland for you. Uh, she had, this was this old woman who bought bits and pieces from all over the city. Mm-hmm. She'd gone to the customs house and it was banned in Ireland in 1956, 57, whenever it was because of the, the, the woman in a, a woman in a bikini, one of the drawings of something else was his ideal woman, or the, it was just deemed And that to be, book was banned. Yeah. And, it, <laughs> <laughs> and somebody picked it up all those years later. So, so you're kind of, you are the mystery person on the front of, how did that feel as a, as a woman or as a person who loved him to have your face cut out? Did you understand because you'd been through all the politics? Well, of, I think I didn't take it personal. Did you know? I didn't take it personal. I just figured that um, I, I was thrilled that it was on there. All right. You know, and even when I saw it, I said, oh, that's me. All right. All right. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's could this, you know, who's the luckiest yeah. woman in the world? Yeah. Could this, could be, this you? be you? Or something like that. So I guess they, they had a reason for doing it, you know. But it didn't really, it, I did not take it personal as, as how dare them cut my face but the out. Photo, your photographs, and um, those wonderful photographs in the book, and I see, I mm-hmm. hear these are coming out in video. Uh, well, I don't know if those particular ones are, but of, of Elvis with the little cap. 
Like yeah, that was had. that was my uh, that, that was my picture. Did you take that? I took that picture. Well, you can. Um, That's fantastic. It's it was my favorite photograph, yeah. and what I did. It's one of the best was, pictures I've ever uh, taken. What is it? Uh, United Press. Press. UP. Yeah, yeah. All right. They. <laughs> some reporter asked me, "Did I have a? Could he have a copy of my favorite picture of Elvis?" All right. And that was my favorite picture. Okay. All you right. know of Elvis, and that's so he's standing there at a jukebox that my brother had built. Out of speakers and everything. It's a tall jukebox with okay. old 45s. Yeah. But if you look at the pictures of uh, uh, me, me sitting on Elvis's lap, yeah. uh, you'll see the same wallpaper in the background that's right. as yeah. in that. Because um, yeah. yeah. that's the room the record player was in. But that you know. picture, that picture was much used. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and not uh, your face was cut out from the front of the magazine, but there mm -hmm. were always pictures of you. Mm -hmm. I think I eternally remember seeing the one of you with your way hand around his waist in the ranch. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, that, that, that was, that was everywhere. Was everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So um, so you were central to Presley's life at that stage, and then I've seen since then you kind of told Gernick the story. Well, he read he read the story from oh, a manuscript that I had already okay. been working on. All right, all right. Rather than me tell him over and over, I said I've got a manuscript that I have just f completed. I mean, what I like <clears> most about it is because I know your story and I know Elvis's story. Mm -hmm. To me, it's it's far more than that because it evokes a time that. Despite your comment earlier, I was too young to actually have celebrated or be there. Mm -hmm. But it was something I always longed for growing up in the 60s. I remember I have a diary entry in 1966 where I say, I wish I, in fact, it was having seen that book. I saw some of the photographs and I just remember saying, I wish I was in Memphis in 56. I always wanted it to be back great, there. It was a great year. Right. You know, um, I, I'm hoping it's not the best year of my life that's yet to come. <laughs> um, but okay. I can say it was probably the best year of my life. And Elvis has, himself has been quoted as saying that 1956 was the best year of his life. Well, there's even a video just focusing on one year, Elvis 56, which mm -hmm. is narrated by Lee Von Helm of the mm -hmm. band. And uh, I don't think I'm even in it. How could they miss me? Well, maybe they, <laughs> maybe they, can't, they can't in future. <laughs> so what about the elements? You see, because I also got, and you probably <clears throat> had, uh, couldn't have read it yet. Maybe you did. Priscilla, the new book on Priscilla. No, I haven't. I, I got a copy of that, because I'm doing a book with Nancy Griffith. Mm -hmm. with a uh, random house in New York mm -hmm. and they're publishing crown publishing I published the Priscilla book and I got that and that is this woman obviously has set out to rewrite the Priscilla story that she didn't write and put in all the CD stuff could that be done on you no no but you there was no CD stuff well the CD, CD. this uh, this goes on you know there's everything is told in this right CD there's a pretty particularly horrifying image of Red West See, Red West was a decent guy in my well, book, and I feel even at the end. He... Well, see, I wasn't there at the end. Okay. But this is this is the way I feel about about Red West. I was there when Red West and Elvis were real close buddies. One would take up for the other one. One would stop a bullet for the other one. It was that type of close uh, friendship between right. Red West and and Red was the only one in the gang that had any good sense. Right. You know, even though he did unzip his pants more than the rest of them or All get right. caught at yeah. it. But I feel that if Red and Elvis did not uh, go their separate ways in 1976, even though the book came out, um, you know, and that may have hurt Elvis's yeah. feelings, but I think ha had that not happened, had Elvis and Red not, um, if their friendship would not have dissolved, then Elvis might be alive today because I think Red would have tried to do something. Well, their argument always was, and I remember even at the time that they were doing the book, and everybody said, yeah, 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 to try and wake him up. Like the title, Elvis, and that what was, happened? Yeah. Like, just say, Elvis, this is your life. Take a look at it before you die. But maybe this, you know maybe I mean? this was. Uh, but how do you feel, and because your book is a love story and it's innocent, and uh, I mean, at one part that I have quoted in this, uh, that Hot Press, my magazine, just didn't believe was the, and you have to put this in the context of Ireland even in 1997, like you sleeping in Elvis's bed mm -hmm. with Gladys hovering outside the door. She wasn't hovering. Was she, she was not? sleeping in the room next door. But she stopped. The walls she came were in. thin. She heard us giggling. Uh, I mean, we were laughing hysterically, you know, well, you know, when you're just young and in love and you just laugh and laugh and laugh. And, and I guess that little signal that it was being, it was quiet in there that she, maybe it signaled her that something was not right. <laughs> and she was right. She was not, you know, uh -uh. she was in the next room. Uh, so, I mean, it, we had quite a bit of quietness before right. 
before the little, but she okay. did not. Okay. She did not open the door until Elvis said, come in. Have you cursed her since then for coming in? No. Have you not? No, because see, that makes me special. I'm the it one does. that got away. You are, yeah. <laughs> Because of uh, only because of Elvis's mother. <laughs> it's for you. <laughs> it's God calling. <laughs> but, but did you not? I mean, when, when you were when you were older and you looked at him, we'd say, and most women I know, and even I've talked to someone like Gordon Stoker, who said that like 68, 69, back in Vegas, he was, and Dory Previn, who's, who's a friend of mine said the man was so sexually attractive and dynamic at that particular stage, too. Did you not look at him again and say, well, God damn it. Oh, yeah, in 69, when I went out there to see him? Oh, yeah. I mean... <laughs> what? I felt like I was going to stick to the chair. Well, so yeah, okay, yeah. That's what I've heard. That's what I've heard about that was 69. in 69. Yeah. And, I mean, he just, he was the most gorgeous thing. He was, yeah. And, uh, I mean, his sideburns were a little too thick. All and right. too long, okay. and his hair was dyed jet black. Yeah. But that did not distract from this gorgeous, tall, right. thin creature right. up there. Right. right. He was also, see, we're, we're very unfortunate, those of us who never saw it, <clears throat> because the movies we see, like that's the way it is, were a year later. Mm -hmm. Nobody filmed the, the absolute, like the, the seven minutes suspicious mind karate workout. Mm -hmm. that's a, that apparently was, alongside 68, if we're to believe, one of the highlights were musically, artistically, looks-wise, as a man. Mm -hmm. He was at a peak there, wasn't he? Oh, he yeah. was. And, you still and stick to the chair now. You still don't even think back then. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's all right. That's a serious sound. <laughs> what you say there is, I'm the one who got away. I mean, would you have realized, because uh, <clears throat> if Priscilla's book, the Biz book by Suzanne Finstad, is to be believed, and um, the other book that came out last year, Revelations from the Memphis Mafia. Have you seen that one? I the big thick it. volume. I, it disturbs me to read trash does about it? Elvis. It, it really does. Well, it they, really they does. So them. I don't care to. But they would refer to you. And to would me? you not even check that out? If they would refer to the relationships, yeah, I think it's in, or maybe it's Esposito's, the relationships. You see, there's so many of them have come yeah. out in the past six months. But you are the one who got away. And according to them, he was licentious and irresponsible. And there's another book I read called The Inner Elvis by a psychologist in America, and it's actually not trash at all. Mm -hmm. But it goes into the whole thing of, now, sensationalism is the suggestion that he had a sexual affair with his mother, which you have read in America. Yes. Haven't you read that? Yes. I've heard it and read it and everything. Oh, it what, just... What, what's he your didn't meaning? have any relationship. Right. He had a relationship with his mother, but it was one of a loving son, right. devoted mother. Uh, it was a close-knit southern family. I okay. had a relationship with my mother. I slept in the bed with my mother because my brother and I shared a bedroom. And when my mother divorced, I slept in the bed with my mother. That does not make okay. it an abnormal okay. relationship. And right. I don't think, I think that was made up. I don't think Elvis would have been in, in bed with his mother at age 15. Yeah, I no, don't I believe it. Do Nor do I. But I it, don't apparently, Dee Presley is supposed to have sold it to the Inquirer. This is where the whole thing started. Well, Dee Presley, take it for what it's worth. No, I know. But this has found its way, you see, but it's found its way into, and you as the lover who got away, mm -hmm. like now you have the people saying, well, he couldn't sleep with mothers. What was his problem? Why would he not sleep with Priscilla after she became a mother? Did he have a big, huge hang-up there? Mm -hmm. and would you have evidenced any of that kind of sexual hang-up or no. reticence on his behalf mm -mm. then? No. No. Not during my time. No. I mean, uh, God only knows, look how long I waited for this book to be published. If I'd have known anything or, or thought anything weird, maybe right. I would have said, Elvis, excuse me, but I'm going to tell him a little deeper secret, you know, and chances right. are that'll help me get my book published because I did want to get the, the book sure. published. Sure, But there, uh, no, nothing like that ever happened. So he was a healthy young man and you were a healthy as young woman? As far as I'm concerned, he was. Okay. And he was perfect. Yeah? Yeah, and he, I, to me, he respected women. Uh, well, I know he respected me. He respected you, though. You mm -hmm. see, but these other claims of like three and four groupies and even DJ Fontana mm -hmm. describing the, the Cadillac in 56, and maybe before he went back to Memphis. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be this divide in him. And now I love, I'm speaking to someone who loves Elvis and he's been a huge factor in my life. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to belittle him. But I am trying to understand mm -hmm. the schism between like the bad girls in Vegas would say at the same time, if it was Tempest Storm or mm -hmm. whoever else, mm -hmm. and, and the showgirls, and them coming home to you, and you were the good girl, and it was Mama, she, she's, not gonna, she's gonna remain a virgin until we're married. Mm -hmm. That was like one view of woman. 
And then... Well, see, that's, that's all I know about is, is okay. my view. But you were hurt when you brought over other, when you saw these photographs uh, Only <clears throat> The only time was I was it? really hurt was on the, the Christmas when she yeah. was sitting there with him, and that was his second. I could have overlooked yeah. that first one. All right. Uh, but the second one, and the second one being on Christmas Day, yeah. I, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't excuse that. Yeah. No. Well, how did you reconcile the sensitivity of a young man you, you do depict as incredibly sensitive as that kind of insensitivity? Did that hurt? Well, did, could I, you? no, I, I mean, I thought, um, well, I, you know, in my head, I said, you can go to hell. All right. You never existed in my life. All how right. could how could you do something like this? But then when I look back at the situation, um, Colonel Parker ha oh, yeah. had it in for me. Sure. So uh, it, chances are it was his suggestion mm -hmm. to bring these showgirls as a house guest. And because it did not deserve good. first uh, a front page uh, newspaper stand front page right. for both of these girls' pictures. Not You didn't have to buy the newspaper and open it because I never bought a paper. But, I mean, a drugstore is right by my house. Okay. Colonel Parker sent this message down to me by the commercial appeal right. on the front page. And when I the first one was okay. I picked up the paper and read about it. The second one was taken on Christmas Day, right. and I, and it was like two days after Christmas that that, that was standing in the face. Right. And if Colonel Parker didn't think that I was going to see it, he knew that enough of my friends would sure. see it and make sure that I got to see it. So Colonel Parker had had a hand in our breakup. But then again, I can't give him the total credit for breakups because Elvis could have said, yeah. I'm going to have June with me for Christmas if yeah. I'm going to have anyone. That's true. I'll throw some girls in between, but I'm going to have June with me. And then, you know, and explain to her because he, all, he told me, don't believe anything you read, only half of what you see. And every it, it, when you see me linked with another female, it's for publicity purposes only. All right. All right. So that's all well and fine. But how much publicity purposes am I going to swallow? Sure. You know? Yeah. yeah. But do you believe that was the case or because he said the same thing to, to Priscilla when he was with Anne margaret in Hollywood, you what, know? What, that he wasn't? Yeah, he was saying kind of, this is just a drum of publicity for a movie. And apparently, according to anything I've read from the most legitimate bios right through to trash, mm -hmm. Elvis was trying to make it with every co-star he was with. And not just the co-stars, but the wardrobe girl and mm -hmm. other. And not just make it, I don't mean it because, and I'm glad you pointed out in the book, he was not just a horny rooster who only wanted to, excuse the mm -hmm. language, fuck a woman. Mm -hmm. He was a romantic. Now, he had the sexual desire, but well, he also I, I had... Think he, I think after, <clears throat> after this, I think because of Colonel Parker shoving all these women at him, I think he wanted his goal was to conquer as many as possible. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. But he didn't have to worry about me anymore. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, no. but it did hurt you, didn't it? Oh, did it? yes, it did. Yes, it did. Does it doesn't hurt me anymore. Does it not? No. Did it cast a shadow of your marriage? Just the, the heartbreak of having loved and lost Elvis made a, uh, a shadow, but not, not a strong shadow. Did it not? No. Like you weren't because trying to? I was, no, because I, I would not listen to the radio. Okay. I didn't watch his movies. Uh, it was Freeze not a word out. in my house. It was uh, get on with my life and appreciate my husband for the good man that he was. All right. And to raise my children and be the perfect mother. And, and my children today will tell you that I was the perfect mother. So no, I just wondered if, if yeah, you tried to replace Elvis or shape somebody else in his no, in no, journey, no. that stuff. Uh -uh. No, no, uh, no. You, you couldn't replace Elvis. Yeah, but you were also at that age where you were incredibly impressionable. Maybe there are women who met him later in life and said, I can easily replace him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, the, the man who, especially the last couple of years, I'll always life. remember him as my, my first true Your love. First love. And I'll always have a spot in my heart for the man, even today. Sure. So, um, but you got the best of them, didn't you? You really get the best I, of them. I think right. so. I, I mean, when I refer to, uh, when I talk about Elvis, I have to say my Elvis because he is so different. My Elvis is so different than the Elvis Presley everyone talks about today. You mean the image we have of the the, the end, the drugs, mm -hmm. the white suits, the Vegas? Not even that. just the end, the beginning. I mean, the, uh, oh, okay. the middle and the end. All and right. in the beginning, you know, he was mine and he was perfect and he was wonderful. And that's my memories. And you, you claim, and this was the first time I read this, because Larry Geller claims he gave him the profit. Larry Geller? Yep. Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, you can, let's see. The guy that gave me the copy of the prophet's name was Earl Cobble, a drummer 
from New Orleans. All right. Earl Cobble. If you want to research that, I don't even, don't even know if Earl's still alive. But I had dated Earl several times. All right. And Earl gave me the copy of The Prophet. Had no idea what it was or anything, but I enjoyed reading it. Right. It made me think. Because you have to think a lot because sure. of the, the way this man writes. But no, no, I have to say, Geller, whoever his name is, no, I, he's full of shit. <laughs> well, this is, well, you're not alone in thinking that. No, the guy was He may have given him other books along yeah, the yeah, same yeah. line. He did, yeah. But, honey, the prophet belonged to me. <laughs> I, that was a gift of mine. Why in the uh, hell would I make up something like that and name my book well, the way I did, you yeah, know? Yeah. No, no I but it, it indicates to me, I don't doubt you, yeah. June. Okay. I'm not, I'm only... Oh, Geller might have something yeah. to say about it. No, Geller, Geller, is, uh, um, Geller claims that he's the person, and this is why I think it's really interesting that you're rewriting the history of Elvis at that level. Geller claims that Elvis was like a spiritual being afloat in space when he met him in 64, and that he came into the room with all these new age, uh, neo-hippie kind of tracts, the, this, the, um, the impersonal life, the prophet, he claims. And Presley said to him in the bathroom after he'd done a ceremony, I've never seen anything like this my life has started again mm -hmm. and there, it, there is the aspect then and it is true that the more Elvis got involved in that and it probably did start with you the more Parker got angry and the more Priscilla got angry and at one point they had a fire in Graceland and they burned his books right. mm. you know what I mean because Parker was terrified that he was losing control <clears throat> and he had Geller banned from the house so as much as it doesn't matter who get the fact Geller was pushing him in other maybe directions. Colonel Parker saw his copy of the Prophet way back then. <laughs> <laughs> Could that be the reason he said get rid of this girl from Biloxi? <laughs> you don't know. You no, know I don't. Mean? Because let me tell you something. Let me tell you something that I control. didn't know. I didn't know until doing research for this book that Nick Adams was a hired, paid informant by Colonel Parker. Nick Adams right. didn't have a job. He was a, a halfway decent yeah. actor, you know, nothing to look at. All right. Charming personality, but, and I didn't realize Nick was spying on me to report back to the colonel. All right. But Nick knew about the prophet. All right. So there is a possibility there. Did, but that element of Elvis, you see, and I could, I, uh, I've been to Memphis and I've been, to, I've been to Spain. I've been to Memphis and I know the gospel base and, and the, the element of singing and singing out and all that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was, even when Elvis sat down and sang piano when you were like away for a weekend or whatever, did you feel the music was coming from that kind of fundamentally beyond the blues in the country, a gospel base, even unchained melody? I guess so. I, I guess you know I have I mean? to agree because it uh, because it came from the soul. Even yeah. uh, "Love Me Tender," you listen to to the way he sings that. I is, mean, it, it come, is that, it so that strange? Could, that could be a hymn. A hymn the way <laughs> Love he does me it. Love tender. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What well, is it so strange? Is it so strange? You know that My song? tune. Yeah. <clears throat> Do I know it? Do you know it? Yeah, I know it. <laughs> I remember. I, I didn't. I didn't really like all of the lyrics, but the okay. first, the, but the part that that really caught me was, "Is it so strange that I love you more than all the world? Yeah. Is it so strange I have no eyes for any other girl? Yeah. You know, won't you take me back and say that you still love me? To waste, I don't like that. Won't you take me back part? But to waste a love like ours would be yes, a sin." Yeah. And he even does, um, when he sang it before, he even does um, key change on sin. in it. On, on, on sin. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, that, That's how much I know. That was mine. That was, was my it? idea for the key oh, change. Oh, so well. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. When I was 14, I brought the record to my hippie friends who were playing Jimi Hendrix. And I said, do you want to hear a singer? Mm -hmm. I remember sitting down with one of these record players you could play out in the grass mm -hmm. and saying, listen to the way he sings sin. Mm -hmm. uh, but that so it's was, that way you got it, but it's that beautiful was, too. I mean, to me, and, and when I heard it, because see, he had, he had done it without yeah. going up on the end, and uh, I mean, I've always been probably a musician in my heart. All I have right. never had any um, music lessons or anything, but my daughter has had music lessons and voice lessons. Right. Um, uh, her voice teacher uh, and the her accompani accompanist. Right. <laughs> Okay. Spit that out. Uh, I say I would. Th I think. Like, wait a minute. Let me. Let me give you a for instance uh, on this. Uh, I'm thinking as time goes by. 
basically it's sung, you must remember yeah. this, a kiss is still a kiss, yeah. a smile is just a smile. Okay, she did this and I said, you must remember this, a kiss is still a kiss, a sigh just a is just a sigh. And she just knocked their socks off right. with that arrangement. Okay. Because it's not played, yeah, and her, not, her her it's not straight. Right, her piano, uh, uh, the lady that used to accompany her, went crazy with it because it was hard for her to do because she was strictly a music oh, yeah, yeah. reader, you okay. know. Okay. And, and I, so I have to put a, a, a beat with it so that she yeah. know where to come back in. But that's the little things that, uh, yeah. like that, that the one same. little song, but that. Uh, that, that, that's the, that's the that gospel. change in that. But that's the gospel and blues pace, isn't it? <clears throat> I guess I'm a gospel blues type oh, what person. What is it? And I, that's the kind of heart that I have for music. All right. But, that's but where I was so tickled when he went up on that <laughs> and made that key chain. But what you weren't, what about you weren't really tickled when he did Unchained Melody eventually, were you? It was a pretty dark version of what he did. Well, yeah, but it was later on. Yeah. And that was, uh, it was blue. recorded live while well, yeah, he was that on was, stage. Yeah, that's right. It was yeah. never done in the studio. Do, do you, so. know, you know that it was one of the last songs he sang on Earth? No, I didn't know that. Two last songs he sang that night uh, by the piano before he went up to bed were uh, Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain and Unchained Melody. No kidding. That, mm, that hurts. Okay, I can understand that. Mm. You know? But I remember when... You we, know that for sure? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I've done my research. You know, blue Eyes songs. Crying in the Rain. Yeah. Well, most you, of his girlfriends had blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say he was thinking about me. Of course, we used to walk in the rain. On, I, uh, <laughs> no, but think of it. I mean, if one of the last verses was, um, someday when we meet up yonder, we'll walk hand in hand again mm -hmm. in the land that knows no parting. Blue eyes crying in the rain. As one of your last songs. Mm -hmm. Okay. As one of your last songs ever. And if you ever saw that clip, you know, the famous last concert where he's really overweight, he sits down at the piano. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see that? And does Unchained Melody. And even Bono from U2 has said to me, and people like Nick Cave, these great rockers, mm -hmm. they love that moment mm -hmm. because they say, despite the fact that he's out there somewhere and his eyes are all, he's had the eyes lifted <coughs> and his, he just looks lost. Mm -hmm. He looks at the camera and he looks at the audience while he's hitting Unchained Melody and it's like, I am still Elvis. Mm. You know, you may not, you may have missed this. Who knows, but he may have been saying, June, I hope you're listening to this no, piece. No, he could have, couldn't he? Why would he not? Because for <laughs> he, see, to me, it's, it's been said that he became incredibly nostalgic towards the end of his life for the innocent days. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry to bring it up. Or just to uh, unchain Melody because, you know, he knew it was my favorite song. And, uh, and when he found an upright piano backstage, this was in Florida, and grabbed my hand and we ran, you know, we just bypassed everybody in this room about this size. And uh, and it really sounded good about this size. And he and I sat down next to him on the bench and he looked at me and he hit those, and I knew what he was gonna play and then he sang it to me. And uh, I mean, I was just filled with, uh, filled with joy, you know. And that's why it makes me sad to see, but it also then, that I should be the one who tells you that it was one of the last songs he sang on the planet. I can, I can well imagine how, as you get older, you plan for the most, most innocent moment of your life. And I very much would suspect that Elvis thought 56 was that year. He always said one of the highlights of his life was giving the gold disc, the first gold disc to his mother, Heartbreak Hotel. Mm -hmm. And that kicked off 56. So, you know, it must have been, and, and your love affair. And also the fame and the movie yeah. and the tours. It must have been a moment he, uh, he cherished, you know? So it doesn't surprise me. You're making me, me very sad, Joe oh, Jackson. I'm sorry, yeah, but this is, <laughs> well, this is where I was connects, though. This is where I'm, I'm just a guy who loves music in Ireland, but this is what he evokes in me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He evokes real feeling. Mm -hmm. I just did, I did, did Margaret tell you what I was doing this morning, what I was out in RTE doing? Mm -mm. I was judging a competition to bring two people to Memphis tomorrow. Fly them in tomorrow yeah. in Memphis. Yeah. I'm bringing people. Uh, impersonators? No, no, two fans. Two, two fans? Yeah. Well, how are you judging them? I ju because they all wrote in for the past three weeks on oh. Irish radio and, and they told me what Elvis meant to them. And the person I finally picked this morning, I mean, I just said to the, the, one of the judges, I said, Did you hear that eight year old boy who rang in and said his favorite song is If I Can Dream? I said, That's not Teddy Bear. Yeah. That's not Hound Dog. That's my favorite song. Yeah. And I said, There's a little boy. 
and he's saying, I'd love to go to Graceland because I want to see where Elvis came from and I understand him better. But the people we picked are actually people that, in 1959, this guy's wife was dangerously ill. And I think, I would believe the, the letter is authentic. They had mm -hmm. it authenticated by Sotheby's. It's only two or three lines. But he wrote to Elvis asking Elvis would he write a cheer-up note to her in a Dublin hospital. Mm -hmm. And Elvis did. I have no doubt that he did. You know? I have well, no they doubt. had it authenticated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this guy started crying on the, on the phone this morning when mm -hmm. I said, I'll see you in the morning, get ready for Memphis. <laughs> I have no doubt. You know? But it's not the level at which, no matter what stories are told or who tries to trash his image, and this to me is the great thing about um, 20 years later. You know, the tragedy and the pain I felt, and I'm sure you felt this day or whatever day, last Tuesday, 20 years ago, and then the Goldman book, which tried to annihilate him, and all the trash that came out afterwards. 20 years later, people like you and I are going to get moved by even talking about him. Mm -hmm. Someone on the radio, an eight-year-old child, and Lord knows what in Memphis for the next weekend. So at that level, doesn't the spirit live? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. No matter what they try to do. I right. mean, and that's, that to me is what Unchained Melody is about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like some, somewhere out there. No matter, it, you know, life may remove our bodies. Well, um, that's, that's why I think that's you, why, there, there's that's so why women. this uh, quote from the prophet touched me so much. All right. You know, and you shall sing to me a deeper song. All right. It just, that was it. Same I thing, isn't it? It. Mm -hmm. it's the same, it is the same mm -hmm. thing, a melody that's unchained. Mm -hmm. You know, now I'm really going to get you upset. So <laughs> Are we all done, Joe? Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> give me another couple i got to get away from you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, just talk, talk to me a little about Gladys because she's uh, she's um, now being uh, attempted to annihilate her as an alcoholic, and that there was lots of violence in their home. Would you have been aware of any of that? They now say that when Elvis was phoning home, it wasn't to see; it was checked to see if he and the he and Vernon had been she and Vernon had been beating each other in alcoholic stupor. Um, was any of is any of that, that news? That if the, if that happened at all, it had to happen after me. All right. Because uh, the two of them, you know. The only, the only kind of a pinch of an argument that I may have heard, if you can call it an argument, was Mrs. Presley was condemning the colonel and uh, he, he don't know what he's doing. Uh, he's not doing what's best for you. You know, you, do, you, you don't need all these uh, road trips back to back, blah, right. blah, blah. Right. And Vernon said, leave the man alone. He's doing a good job, you know. At first she says, I just don't trust the man. And Vernon said, leave the man alone. He's doing a good job. And that was the only, right. like, disagreement that I ever heard between the two of them. Well, Gladys's instincts were right. Absolutely. She was a very smart woman. I didn't even know about birth control pills until I was married, after two years that I was married. Right. And here she said, let's give June some pills. I don't know if they put the pill part on. No, they didn't. They didn't. She said, let's get June some pills to keep her from having too many babies. And well, <laughs> you what told the hell is she aspirin, talking did you? about? You told they were <laughs> Well, aspirin works if you hold it between your knees. <laughs> I bet it does. But, <laughs> <laughs> Not in Ireland. But they see, tried it. I mean, that, to me, that was amazing. Okay. And when yeah. I think about that, uh, because I didn't know a, such a thing as a birth control existed until after oh, my uh, son right. was born and six months old and I did not want to get pregnant again, then I learned of birth control pills. But do, had she got that kind of, had, didn't the family have that spiritual or, or vocal base, you know, like sitting at a piano was second nature to them? Um, or, or is that not true? I've never, I never did hear Mrs. Oh, Presley no, sing. Okay. Um, um, and I don't think Mr. Presley was much of a singer. All right. But uh, chances are she may have, but we had the Jordan Ayers over one night, right before they were rehearsing for the Sullivan Show, and then after they got the main tunes wow. out of the way, you talk about goosebumps. We're in the living room. It's about like half this size, like big living room, and we're in a, a circle on the floor, and uh, there's Elvis and me, and I can't remember the names of the Jordanaires. Right. And Elvis is always sitting next to the bass singer because he yeah. wanted so badly to, to have bass that singer. bass voice yeah, yeah. and that's the one that you feel is the bass man mm. when you feel music you know you appreciate the tenor but the bass you feel yeah, yeah. so but they did after they got their their tunes uh, for the show uh rehearsed then they went into some old-fashioned gospel right. gospel music and they did uh in the valley which was All a right. song that i knew how to sing the tenor part to. All right. 
And so when I joined in this one area of this song that I knew how to sing, I mean, we're, I'm surrounded by a million, a million beautiful voices, you know, and so I, I join in on that particular part, so I'm jumping all over the tenor. Right, yeah, you know, in other words, yeah. I'm stealing his yeah, yeah. Uh, his thunder. He shuts up, mm -hmm. and I finish singing it with the Jordanaires, you oh, know. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, Elvis's mother and father were sitting over on the couch, and Elvis is just grinning his ass off, just tickled because uh, his girl can carry a <laughs> tune, and she's kind of a gutsy girl too, you know. Oh, but right. we used to sing in the car, do harmony all the time in the car. But I really enjoyed uh, singing harmony. It's. Uh, but wasn't it? You see, this is what people are. Uh, I don't understand as a criticism. I like to go in two or three more minutes. Okay. <laughs> Where I'm getting you smiling before you walk I'm out. I'm enjoying the music. Okay. I really am. No, the um, the new box set has these home recordings, which were, they say were discovered like very recently, mm -hmm. and they have him singing "Blowing in the Wind," which is later. Mm -hmm. But he's singing. He's singing a bass part. Oh, he is. Yeah, he does it way down. Mm -hmm. Not Dylan's version. Wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. But some critics are saying. Is it true that when Elvis was on his own like that, he didn't veer towards blues songs? He went to pop. He loved, like Mario Lanz or Dean Martin, mm -hmm. the great songs that you sing out, apart from the gospel. Mm -hmm. And the Unchained Melody and stuff like that would suggest that mm -hmm. that's what he liked to sing. Mm -hmm. Pop songs, the ink spots and all that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. He, he liked that a lot more than rock and roll. Did he? Uh, sure. Uh, well, he sang it more. There's a picture of here uh, that he's, you can, you can look at his, uh, I don't know if you read the captions under all the pictures. I did, you? But where Red West is in the background with his hand, and, and he was going, boom, 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 All right. Boom, oh, yeah, trying to get boom. the... See, and Elvis is trying to do that. All right, okay. And Red's directing back there, but it was yeah. going from a note to a bass note. I'm not sure where it is. All right. But, it's uh, a color it, shot, isn't it, if I remember? Is it one of the color shots? Mm -hmm, I think so. Great photographs. Um, yeah, you can look at this. All right, okay, see, the hand up. Yeah, you see the yeah, hand up yeah, and the yeah. hands the hands starting to drop <laughs> because he he had started it real real high. <laughs> and and I mean Elvis would just literally get off when he I mean, you know, just really get off when he would get a really, really low note. He loved all it. Right, all right. So. But he did love singing, didn't he? Mm hmm Whatever else. Mm -hmm. I mean that was the same thing. He loved to sing. Yeah. All right. Okay. He loved it. And did he? But he apparently, I mean, I've heard he was to join the Song Fellows, that he would have been a pop star, that really the Sam Phillips pushing him down the blues line that just happened, that he just wanted to sing. He, he would have sang anything. Anybody says, hey, I'm going to make a record of you sing this uh, uh, A, B, C, D, F, G. All right. All right. <laughs> he would just have done it. it. All right. You didn't make secret tapes, did you? No. That the I wish, world would want. I, uh, I just wish I would have had uh, an answer machine and recorded that. Uh, <laughs> All right. Um, Where he sang you, um, yeah, Love Me Tender. Love Me Tender. Right, I mean, okay. The yeah. original draft. Over the phone. Uh -huh. Hi, Joe Jackson here again. That interview, which took place in Dublin Shelburne Hotel, did end abruptly because we were running way over time. Either way, Thank you for listening. And if you want to read some of the articles I wrote based on interviews with other people in Elvis's life, check out my website, joejacksoninterviewer.com.